Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the final day of IMS, uh, a glorious Friday afternoon. And what better way to kick it off than with a keynote interview with two of the music scenes legends, not even electronic music scene, just music scenes legends. For almost 40 years, uh, these two gentlemen have been making uh, terrific future pop, future dance music, whatever you want to call it. Uh, even their own website uh, struggles to pin down the magic of yellow. Here's what they say. They're a trans-global studio trick sound, a branch of music that defies categorization. What could you possibly call a crossing of avant-garde pop, fake rap, and sound witchcraft? A headstrong mix of funk and humor, pre-techno and snappy woodwind sets. Yellow have been called idiosyncratic, eccentric, quixotic, and exceptional. But don't take their word for it. Here's what Shirley Bassey said, or Dame Shirley Bassey, who's not a woman who takes fools lightly. Dame Shirley Bassey said, England is insular. Uh, so shut off from the energy of the world. So anything from outside takes on a kind of glitter. The thing that's special about yellow is that they don't use that glitter to blind people. They use it to excite them, not to quiet them down. So, Boris and Dieter, welcome to IMS. Good afternoon. Hello. Thank you. Now, gentlemen, uh, we've got some big news for us later today, but for now, let's talk about some gl glorious moments from your history. If we can ask you about pre-Yellow, pre-1979. Uh, I've seen you talk about being a professional poker pay pay player from the ages of 17 to 23, when you would play any kind of cards for 14 hours a day, just to be hooked on something. I needed that immediacy to take, me, take away the pain of being confronted with having to create something. So why did you put down the cards and pick up the microphone in the end? I didn't uh, pick up the microphone. I did first after my career as a more or less professional poker player, uh, where I was uh, really escaping the world. You know, if, you, if you're a really serious gambler, you're like a boxer in a boxing ring. There is no world existing outside that boxing ring. But when you play poker, you can do it for 14 hours. You get knocked out eventually, but it takes more time. Now, after this faded away, I was, of course, trying to stop this for quite a long time. It's, it's difficult, like every addiction, you know, you get hooked to gambling. I always taught me uh, when uh, you have so and so much money, you stop it and you go to wherever, to Morocco, and you, re you write a novel, but it never worked out. You know, it's, uh, the, the, the box was sometimes full and sometimes empty, but it, a gambler basically wants to win in order to continue to gamble. You know, that's, that's the idea. But coming back to your question, the first thing I did after this slowly faded away was uh, so-called experimental movies. The liberating factor of doing movies with a little 16 millimeter camera was that you're not immediately confronted with what you're doing. You have an idea, you use your camera, you do all kinds of crazy things, superimpositions, and I always had a little partiture uh, for my images that I did not strictly uh, follow, but you're not confronted immediately with the result. You don't see what you're doing. And this had an almost um, healing factor for me because whatever I tried was uh, like dripping like sand between my fingers and I, 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 it was never good enough. And I, I could not really do it, but with these little movies that were later leading to the yellow videos, it was possible because I didn't see the result. And whenever these films came back from the lab, like three, four days later, and I put them into the projector and I saw them, it was like Christmas for me, because finally I could see Dita, at least you have done this uh, little thing. So it almost had a therapeutical factor. Thank you. Now, Boris, you were a, a teenage, it sounds like an obsessed teenage kid who was experimenting with loops and tapes. Can you describe the scene at home? Did you have a bedroom full of cutting edge technology or things you'd made yourself? Absolutely, I was a teenager, I remember, that's right. And 
uh, at the time, uh, you didn't have this technology as we have today, uh, the digital recording like sampling technology. And um, I always had, even when I was a, a kid, a great affinity to all kind of sounds, uh, noises which occurs on this planet, all kind of sounds. So I started to collect them like, uh, yeah, just like colors, putting them together, recording them on, uh, on an analog tape at the time, the quarter inch tapes, Revox tape machine. And then I just cut the slices uh, oh, no, I, I just cut the tape into slices, each the same length. Then you have a, a certain ribbon, and I just um, uh, patch them together in a in a uh, random running order and just play them over the heads. And I had uh, a kind of a surprising uh, rhythm and already kind of a, a sequence. Uh, and there on I played uh, bongo guitar, whatever, and that was kind of the first. Uh, experience uh, to make music myself because I couldn't play any instruments, couldn't play or read notes, whatever. So, and that was always uh, also kind of the start uh, to uh, bring in some music into yellow. So you both were involved with the Zurich Indie Periphery Perfume, but I believe one of the first things you did together was a performance piece called Dead Cat. Can you tell us about Dead Cat and what your roles were? That's absolutely true. We met uh, uh, at a very small but successful record shop, and this gentleman, he also had a, a little label, Periphery Perfume, and I did my first uh, single on that label called Cry for Fame. We manufactured 120 singles, you know, there was a huge cry for fame, of course, with these very limited edition, and Boris somehow heard it. He was a client at this shop, and he thought, uh, this wasn't really very interesting and very good. And he went there and said, look, listen to my tapes. I'm much more original and much more interesting. And uh, uh, this guy, Paul was his name, listened to Boris's uh, tapes. Um, and uh, then he suggested that uh, he would do uh, also a record with Boris. And here comes the biggest disaster in Boris's life. Yeah, I, can, I, can take, I can take this over. Okay. Uh, because uh, as I remember then, this guy Paul, a tall uh, Polish guy said, yeah, I like your music, but I think it needs a voice and then you're complete and then uh, I'm ready to kind of produce your first uh, single. And I remember the Saturday afternoon, Dieter arrives, uh, me and Carlos per uh, Peron at the time, had a little studio built in a kitchen of an, a little apartment. And I remember the day when Dieter comes in, he say, hello, I'm Dieter. Uh, say, yeah, okay, do you have something, blah, blah. And we play some sequences. And immediately, uh, the guy next to me, Dieter Meyer, takes the microphone. And as he was in a band before uh, playing punk music, he was very loud. His voice was enormous loud in this kitchen. And that was, our luck, because at the at the at the end of the week we had the, what do you call kündigung? You were kicked out of we, the flat. You were kicked out of this people, flat. People, people thought somebody is being murdered uh, <laughs> because I was screaming like I did with all the punk bands that I went on stage. But the real disaster for Boris was number one, uh, as we all know, Boris is a sound painter. You know, he really uses. Uh, music like a painter uses uh, color. And uh, the disaster was a double disaster. First of all, he never really liked anybody or any other element coming into his music, you know, and especially not uh, me because I, I was an incredibly dilettantic singer. You know, I couldn't really sing. I could scream and I had a certain sense of rhythm, which of course was leading, you know, people think that our first big hit in the United States, uh, Bostitz, this was a very clear plan. But there was no plan, because I sang all on one note, not because I wanted to be an avant-garde rapper, because I couldn't sing. And it went like standing at a machine every day for all my life, I'm used to do it, and then it is the only thing I want, is just to rush, push, cash, you know? And they thought, how smart, you know? For the black community of the United States, this was the perfect music, but it was all rubbish, because I just did it uh, because I didn't hit the notes there, you know. But this rubbish uh, was a, a UK club hit, Bostish, 
and it was also used by the emerging hip hop scene for scratching. How did you hear about no, no, that? Absolutely. We, we, the, in the United States, everybody thought that we, the, the black community, we, we, it was played by a famous radio DJ, Frankie Crocker on WBLS, you know, and he had syndicated about the 100 FM stations and it was exploding. But all these black kids, they thought we were two Omogard rappers, black guys from the West Coast, you know. And they were very, they were very surprised when we hit the uh, stage in the, at the Roxy uh, Theater and played there for two nights. They thought, New York, you know, the, the the record label we got, you know, if if you have a a natural born hit, you know, that that's the most valuable thing for a label. So we signed a deal with, I think it was with Warner Brothers or whatever, and uh, they, they wanted us uh, to. Uh, to appear on stage uh, so that people thought, saw that we are real uh, people and not a phantom band, you know. And uh, well, you were mistaken for two black maybe, maybe Boris, you, you tell this story how, uh, I mean, at the entrance already, uh, you know, Boris. Yeah, you, you know, when you come from Switzerland, first time uh, being in New York, big city, you know, like uh, this theater was a roller coaster during the week. and. Uh, I think there are like three to five thousand people, mostly uh, Latin and black people uh, there. And I was, of course, uh, afraid, like uh, you have this fever before you go uh, on stage. And uh, the guy, our manager, came uh, backstage and said, you know, they get a lot of weapons like, you know, guns and, and knives uh, at, the, at the cashier. And I, I thought, wow, you know, my first thought was I just standing uh, like this on stage when a shoot or a knife comes on this side, I can survive, you know. <laughs> and, and what happens was that uh, after like 10 minutes uh, or even five minutes, uh, complete blackout, no electricity anymore, dark during the, during the concert. During the concert. And at the time, there was a, a Fairlight machine, a sampling machine, which I steer all the keyboards and stuff. So you have to start uh, from the beginning, you know. And, and if you have a, a crash like a, 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 a blackout in electricity, this uh, very sensible hard disk could blow up. Happy enough, it doesn't happen. So, But it was a great uh, 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 adventure. The, the most delicate moment was, you know, we were announced by uh, a very famous uh, disco queen. You know, she was a, a Marilyn Monroe type, super Marilyn Monroe. She came on stage and she said, uh, good evening, my name is Diane Brill and I give you yellow. And then it went, the big applause, you know, and it went dark. And then the big applause still there light on us, silence, you know. Nobody uh, could believe that these were two cheese heads from Switzerland, you know, that did this. Anyhow, the gig went well, the second gig went well, and the other very funny thing was, after the second uh, concert, uh, a lot of these black um, people, they came up to me, up to Boris and said, pizza party, pizza party. You know, I didn't understand what, what, what do they mean, pizza party. Now, in the in the in the chorus of the of the song, I go, everybody needs somebody. Sometimes, some, and they understood everybody, pizza party, pizza. So the misunderstanding, because they really loved the idea that everybody has a pizza party, was a, a, a very important factor of our first success in the United States. We were a total misunderstanding, basically. <laughs> Another, another, <laughs> another funny story was uh, 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 an album release in, in England, in the Camden Palace. Uh, we are, perhaps you tell this story, your English is much uh, preciser than mine, where uh, we, we drive, we drove from the airport into the city and we see huge... Yeah, but, but you must, the, the important thing is, yeah. you know, uh, there, there was a guy, sorry to interrupt you, because yes. the, the real disaster was uh, we had uh, agreed uh, to do to show some videos and uh, talk to the audience there and uh, so we came to London and on the way to the hotel we saw hundreds of posters yellow life at the Camden Palace 
you know. And the guy who uh, organized this said, oh, I'm so sorry, uh, it was a mistake and you have to help me out and blah, blah, you know. But of course he planned this, that you can't let me down, you have to do something life, you know. And we agreed we didn't want to let him down and we rehearsed some playback show singing to our and the first two songs went kind of okay and then but Boris came on stage with uh, a piece called the swing doom 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 it was that, that song was yeah and in the middle of his song Boris was happily performing a cut to a David Bowie track it was a disaster on stage, you know. I mean, a total, uh, Boris was throwing his microphone and it was like, and the funniest thing was that the next day, the, the music press was full of praise for these two Swiss guys who took the piss of playback shows. They thought, I mean, nobody can be that stupid, you know, to interrupt his own song with a David Bowie song, you know, it was very funny. Uh, so these two Swiss cheeseheads, uh, you had more accidental success with Stella in 1985 with the song Oh Yeah. Now, the story goes that you came up with some beautiful lyrics about beauty and the moon, etc., etc. And Boris, she said to him, no, these lyrics are too complicated. I have the idea of a fat little monster, very relaxed and sitting there saying, oh yeah, oh yeah. Can you tell us about that creative tussle and how that produced one of your biggest ever songs? The idea was first, you know, like as I'm working uh, like a painter, uh, mixing first some colors together and then like a patchwork, putting together a certain scape or a certain uh, soundscape or a sound building. And the first uh, uh, significant uh, sound in it was do, bow, bow, chicka, chicka. And then I thought we, uh, our uh, friend Ian Trigoning, which brought us here uh, uh, anyway, he had the idea uh, that uh, he was a part uh, in, in the studio and we just rehearsed thing and uh, Dieter came in and uh, uh, sing along uh, to this track and just to relax at the end of the session, I thought, why don't you uh, just say, oh yeah, during the whole song, just for fun, and we go back tomorrow, come back tomorrow to recording, and he say, yeah, okay, but uh, I, I do it, but I don't, you know, like, and then uh, I just gave him the idea, you, you just have the feeling you sit in a, or you hang in a, in a, in a chair in the South Sea, and some girls are uh, kind of with, a, you know, like with this uh, a palm tree uh, a leaf, and, uh, and then uh, Dieter came up, and, uh, at the, and the other day, then we thought, wow, this is a, a very interesting, uh, very interesting track. But we didn't thought that this track would made all the way through, like a, a kind of being a, a, an icon uh, in our music history. Well, if the story is correct. It wasn't even meant to be a single until John no. Hughes approached you and said, Absolutely. "Can I have the song for Ferris Bueller's Day Off?" Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the story is a little, little different than what, 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 what Boris said. It was like, uh, you know, normally when I create my limited lyrics for Boris's wonderful sound paintings, I just listen to the track 10, 20 times and I speak, uh, I start in a Suaeli kind of non-existing uh, language. Uh, and uh, normally I somehow uh, get an idea because Boris's sounds, his pictures, his sound pictures are always very inspiring. They're like a movie for me. But with this track, I didn't have, a real, I didn't have an idea. And then Boris said, imagine uh, in the South Sea, you're sitting at the beach, they bring you a wonderful drink and there is a cool breeze coming at you. What would you say in this situation? And I said, oh yeah, uh, that, was, <laughs> that was the thing, you know. And, uh, and, then, and then, of course, he adds, you know, can you imagine the sun a bit hot, but still, oh, yeah, the moon even more beautiful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And Ferris Bueller's Day Off was only the start of that song's afterlife. It's been used uh, in The Simpsons, Glee, uh, Gran Turismo 4, uh, Deadpool last year. Why do you think that particular song has had such a huge afterlife and a cinematic afterlife? I think uh, this, uh, oh yeah, is uh, an expression 
of like uh, sort of unstructured, unconditioned, uh, total happiness. You know, even in the Yankee Stadium, you know, when they have a home run, they play this. Oh yeah, and this sort of very uh, basic, even a little stupid. Oh yeah, you know, it's like a, <laughs> you can tell. Everybody understands the the sort of unconditioned uh, and also a little maybe silly happiness. You know, this is. I, I guess it wouldn't. I guess it wouldn't be uh, uh, that much of a hit if you say, "Oh no," <laughs> you know. <laughs> so yes, it's much more positive, of course. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh no. And Bo Boris, as a self-proclaimed perfectionist and and sound painter. Do you mind if uh, a song like that is used in so many odd, surreal, different environments? You know, as uh, we can say that uh, we, we're not selling that many physical items as we sold like 20 years ago. And I think it's a good, uh, a good help financially to get this circus yellow still, or keep the, uh, the yellow circus alive uh, in a way. And if, if there is not... Uh, uh, a commercial for alcohol or cigarettes, I think, and not too much of a cheap uh, kind of a product. I think that's uh, totally okay. okay. Uh, in 1986, you released the compilation album, the, the New Mix in One Go, which again became a huge club record in the UK. Were you surprised to find that this new audience is picking up on all your music in the UK? I think, to be honest, we, we were always surprised when things were uh, successful, you know. I mean, at the very beginning, uh, we had our tiny little studio in uh, an old factory in Zurich. And basically, uh, for Boris to create these wonderful sounds was a way of life. It, was, it had a, a, an existential meaning for him to be alive. And what happens with this? Uh, was not uh, so uh, important. Like we never were proposing um, uh, to record companies or sending out tapes or anything like this. It was always um, uh, a surprise. And, uh, you know, the success has two sides, you know. It's uh, one aspect is it's, it's, it's nice to have success and the other aspect is that uh, you have like a a monkey on your shoulders who, who, who cries for more of this, you know. And to find back uh, to your uh, creative roots and not uh, sort of after you have smelled the blood of success become a victim of this, this is probably the most difficult thing. But it always came, I mean, all our hits, you know, uh, were total surprises. What we thought was a hit was always a flop. <laughs> it's true, really. Well, you kept having the hits. You had the Rhythm Divine with Billy McKenzie and Shirley Bassey in 87. And then in 88, you did Flag, uh, which sold a million copies worldwide. Uh, the big single, the race, was eight minutes long. Was that a, a vision in your head from the start, Boris, that this song would have that length and that, I guess, momentum within it? You know, as, as Dieter always uh, thought uh, about the tracks I created, was there are many, many, or much too much little ideas on, like a Christmas tree hanging on too much uh, this, this uh, kitschy balls, whatever. So I thought, why not doing a, a longer version uh, with all these elements, but not in a rush or in a fraction of like three minutes, uh, that you just expand and just uh, uh, genießen. Enjoy. Just enjoy all these little details and uh, it became an, uh, a very nice little uh, eight minute journey. Fantastic. And it seemed that you were opening up the idea of what Yellow were about at that time because you know, you worked with Billy McKenzie thereafter on International, and then you, for the first time in, well, a few years later, 97, you brought outside producers in. You had Carl Cox and Ian Tregoning, who you mentioned earlier. Why did you want to work, well, first of all, with Carl Cox on that record on Pocket Universe? That was uh, uh, the idea that um, we, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we had at the time a uh, label manager in, in Germany, Louis Spielmann, and uh, he was, uh, he had the idea that we are kind of give 
all the DJs who are interested in our music because they anyhow pinch details out of our records, uh, some little uh, pieces here and some little pieces there, that we just pull out all the, the, the single stems of, of, of the records. The, the, the DJs prefer they just come to Zurich, pick up the sounds they like, uh, of Clara could see whatever of the uh, all of the tracks, and we invite them to Zurich. And Carl Cox was uh, uh, in the studio, and we played together a, a track. And but the idea was that each of the DJs just uh, remix whatever they like, and they have the pure samples. They don't have to pinch it out of the albums. That was the idea. Even with Moby, no Moby was like he gets the uh, the, the single samples by. Uh, post uh, at the time or by email, I don't know. It's like uh, a jazz player sending the next step, and jazz he's player. jazz player to send uh, the the next step back. Is it true that you have uh, something like a hundred thousand self-created samples and sounds in your library? That's uh, I didn't count them every day, but uh, there must be a lot. Yeah, and uh, you know as the. Uh, a te a technology and sampling, uh, music technology is getting further on. Uh, the old machine Fairlight, uh, which was much too slow, uh, or, or is too slow in these days, uh, I have a library still. Uh, they send it me uh, back from, uh, from Australia because they pick out all the uh, samples. Uh, yeah, I guess there must be uh, a, few, a few dozen thousands, yeah. But the, but the really funniest thing is that all these sounds, or almost all of them, they have a name. So Boris can call them like dogs, you know, like, uh, uh, and he remembers these sounds. It's not a very well-organized library, but he's like really uh, calling a dog. Now, Max, come on, go ahead, you know, and then he finds uh, the sound back, you know. This is the most, and, and the, the, the the, the names of these sounds. We should actually publish uh, a, a book. It would be the most Dadaistic book ever written. Just how Boris calls his sounds, you know, like crazy, crazy names. I mean, like, um, just for him to remember, you know. Yeah, you know Can we have some examples of these crazy at, names? At the end of the day, you have to give a, a certain sound or even a, a rough track. Uh, a name because you want to go home uh, or gonna uh, have dinner or whatever. So you immediately have to come out uh, with a, a certain name for the sound or for the song. And I would like to compare this like uh, these little squirrels when they hide their nuts. They exactly know where the nuts are. And this is kind of a orientation I have in my sound garden or in my sound library in all the different folders. You know, first there is the folder which I exactly know in this folder, I have this and this and these patterns, which I remember exactly which, because I see the name, and this fits to this and this track, so I put Can them together. Can you a couple of examples of recent uh, names of nuts and, and the sounds? Not, 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 not spontaneously, <laughs> because there are so many, I can't fix them right now in my mind. Uh, Dieter, while well, he's been amassing 100,000 uh, nuts in his library, you've been uh, doing art, uh, you've a project rewatch, you make uh, cans into watches, you bought a ranch in Argentina, you have a store and a restaurant in Zurich. Are these all different facets of you being an artist and being a, a creator? Not really. There is a clear separation, and uh, these other things I do because I, I always loved agriculture. I grew up partly in, on the, in the countryside with my grandparents, and uh, I always loved it. And then uh, many, many years later, in 96, I had an opportunity to buy uh, uh, an organic farm, a small farm in Argentina, and everything grew from there. You know, I'm an uh, almost fanatic uh, organic farmer and Argentina is just perfect because it has all the climate zones and the different soils so with the product you want you can go where you have the strongest plant for example with vineyards to be organic is quite difficult because when the rain comes or the fog humidity you have fungus and you either harvest immediately uh, which limits the flavor of your grapes 
uh, or you have to spray. But if you are organic, you cannot spray. Now in Argentina, there is no rain. We get the water in masses exactly when we need it from the mountains, in rivers. We bring the water from the river into the vineyard and it goes straight to the roots and the plant is always dry. So we can produce an organic wine of a high quality with no restrictions. You know? And this is what Argentina is really all about. The same for cattle, the same for almost everything. So, Boris, while he's been busy doing this, you've been working on uh, Yellow's first album in seven years, Toy, which is coming out this October. Now, uh, no one's heard anything outside you guys, but I believe you've been working on about 60 songs uh, in, uh, you said, like, a, like a, mon a monk working in the solitude of a monastery. And this chap's only been allowed in the studio uh, for 30 or 40 days in that whole entire period. What uh, kind of surprises do you have for him and for the, the listening world with this album? Uh, I just could compare this uh, album with the last one, which was more kind of a moody, even a little bit slower, uh, tend, uh, tendency uh, album. This album will be more up-tempo, more, even more poppy, uh, with some, uh, I would say, with some typical uh, yellow sound effects and the face of yellow, of course, is always in this sound. And as uh, we always had some traditionally uh, some guest singers like Shirley Bessie, like um, uh, Rush Winters, uh, Billy McKenzie, of course, we also invite uh, two girls this time, two female singers. Uh, one is uh, Fifi Rong. She's Chinese, living in London, and she has a beautiful voice. She has a kind of a uh, a very, uh, uh, how should I say, magical uh, sounding voice. And the other singer is uh, Malia. She's a, a female jazz singer, which I uh, produced an album with her two, three years ago with the name uh, Convergence. And of course, that was very close to ask her, would you like to be guest on our album? And yeah, um, we are very happy so far with the result and with the uh, feedback of uh, our record companies in England and Germany, of course. Dieter, can you describe the, uh, the first single, Limbo, I believe? Can you describe that to us, please? Well, uh, we all know what in limbo means, you know. It's a situation that we also all know. It's when you have lost, uh, like, the ground under your feet. In, in, in Italy, there is a great expression for when you go bankrupt, they say alle gambe in aria. It means he has his legs in, in, in the air. He, hasn't, he still thinks he's walking, but it's like, uh, you know, like this. And uh, it's uh, uh, making very ironical fun also about me, myself, uh, because I have le gambe in aria quite often in my life, you know. And this is what uh, uh, the song is about. But Maybe one more word about the album uh, that I can talk about uh, even probably better than Boris because uh, he is the creator and I'm invited into his uh, sound pictures, which is always an incredible privilege, very inspiring. And uh, the name Toy is really uh, like, uh, almost like a program. You know, this album we could put under the title uh, To the Future Through the Past. When Boris started to create music, he really um, had, was to be compared with a child in a sand tip or at the beach. And with whatever he finds, he builds his fantastic uh, uh, fantasy uh, castles and he always surprises himself, really like a, like a child who like, does something uh, with uh, not really uh, an architectural or a compositorical plan. So when Boris starts, and this is the, the essence of this album, that he allowed himself to be driven by what happens in the process, you know, which is a very important factor. And I think Boris found back to this, uh, to this process in which he starts with one brush stroke in the painting left in the left corner, he continues, each brush stroke is influencing the next one. It's a very dialectical method in a way. At one point he thinks, uh, I'm painting a rose, 
you know. And as he continues, uh, suddenly he has a donkey there, you know, and he's surprised, you know. It is, this is the, the element of this album. That's why we call it Toy, because it really goes back to the creative uh, beginning of Boris, but now with all the technology, of course, that is available, um, it is uh, like using this technology, but with the approach of a child, you know. One of the good sentences in the Bible, anyhow, I mean, I'm not uh, believing in any of these uh, important creatures that should have made us or whatever, but there, of course, are some good lines in the Bible. And one very good line is by this uh, uh, man, Jesus Christ. He said, we all have to be become like children, not stay like children. This would be childish. And the process to become a child is the most important in everybody's life, to find the roots, uh, the, the, the center of, of your being. And I think this album is very much uh, Boris Blank uh, becoming like a child, and that's toy. Boris, are you taking the same mindset with this app, uh, Electrified, that you're developing? Can you explain to us what that, what that app is and who can, how we use it? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I just follow, or I just had the idea, just at the moment, when Dieter talks about this kind of surprising things coming out of uh, my music technology, inspiration, whatever, there, uh, then I pick up my iPhone because I would like to sh show shortly, if you have the time, uh, a little app which I created with some people from Sweden, developers, uh, programmers, uh, called Yellow Fire, uh, like yellow, like qualify, not like a fire, burning fire. And uh, you can do many funny things. And can you ask, uh, can you hold me for a second, uh, for a second, the microphone? Yeah, this, is a, this is a live recording with a pocket studio. Which you, which you can uh, record. Uh, you have recording possibilities, and I record because I have no drums, nothing with me, but I have my voice. I just record something. Tu, pe, ti, pau. Hey, what? And now we have to put it on the microphone here. And now we're gonna do this like uh, I put this into this sequencer. Wait a minute. Wait. And now, you can, and now you can add, of course, some presets which I created, especially uh, for this app, of course, some bass drums. Everybody, leave me down alone. Come meet everybody, leave me down alone. Everybody is a TV, walk me to be done. Of course, uh, this sounds much nicer. <laughs> Thank you. It, it sounds much nicer, of course, if you, uh, you, if you plug it in and, and play it through your uh, home system, whatever, because it's uh, very, very good quality. It has a real uh, powerful bass drum and basses and whatever. And you can make a, a song. Uh, we invited, uh, or I invited some people like uh, Carl Craig on it. There is Trette Muller, uh, a lot of uh, famous DJs. Uh, they spend a track uh, for this uh, for this uh, record. Ah, and is this when is the app available? The app is uh, the, the the app is available since uh, since two years almost. Okay. I think. But if you if if you listen to the uh, to the to the bass drum and uh, kicks and, and stuff like this, you it's amazing how this how this sounds. Is it, uh, do we have any? So 
I, I made this track uh, while I'm flying to, uh, to, to Ibiza on the, on the airplane. You can do it in 10 minutes. So there's a special IMS track made for us by Yellow. Thank you very much, chaps. The working, so, the, the working title of this project, you know, because everybody has these kind of iPhones, the, his, Boris's working title was Everybody is a Studio. <laughs> no, um, but honestly, if, if, if someone would tell, told me uh, like 35 years ago in the 70s and last century, there will be one day you have a studio in your pocket and for less than a cup of a tea, I wouldn't believe him, you know? <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, we'll have time for some questions in one minute, uh, but just before we start that, I heard a rumor out in the hall that uh, you guys have got some special uh, concert plans for this uh, new album. Can you tell us about that, Dieter? Is this news to you, Boris? Uh, indeed. You know uh, well, <laughs> shall, shall we... Shall we uh, I, have not, uh, I haven't heard. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is actually true uh, that uh, after... Uh, 38 or 39 years, uh, we decided uh, to bring uh, the sound of yellow, the yellow experience uh, on stage. Actually, not on stage. It is a wonderful, wonderful uh, factory in Berlin called uh, Kraftwerk Berlin. And there uh, we, uh, how should I say, um, we, we use the whole room there, this whole wonderful uh, setup uh, to uh, kind of play our music. It will be a very a movie-like uh, experience, a very opera-like experience. And uh, Boris did uh, uh, reload a lot of his uh, pieces uh, that were hits uh, 10, 20 years ago. And it's going to be, we hope, uh, a very unique uh, experience to see yellow life on stage in Berlin. As, uh, at the end of October, between I think the 26th to the 29th or 30 October this year. And so it's a residency in Berlin. Can you then take this residence to other cities around the world? Yeah, if I mean, of, of course, it's it's an adventure for us, and we hope it's working out. It's not your normal rock show that you stand uh, on, that you are on stage and you perform your songs it's a it's it's a, there's a lot of risk in it you know does it work doesn't it work we we, we checked uh, we checked the electricity there <laughs> yeah we, we won't have an electricity problem no no not like uh, uh, in new york and of course if there is a, uh, if, if people are interested uh, then we bring it uh, on tour we might even bring it to to Scotland or to England or to wherever people uh, uh, want to hear it, you know, of course. But it's, it's an adventure. We don't know uh, how it will be uh, received. You hope well, but you never know. Well, thank you very much, chaps. You know, still innovating and still creating brand new on-the-spot tunes after 40 years. Uh, we have a few minutes for some questions. Uh, in the front here, Mark. Stand up? Okay. I wanted to dance earlier when you were playing the app. But uh, my name is Mark Jones from Wall of Sound, and I just wanted to say first, thank you so much for what you've done musically, electronically, and creatively, and given us freedom of mind. But I have quite a lot of questions, but um, we'll, I can do one. Okay. Well... What pizza was your favorite for the pizza party? Uh, for me, it was margarita. Mar margarita. Always margarita, margarita. Okay. Don't, if do you not had, overload it. If you had to pick three tracks that made you do what you do creatively, what are they and why? You mean tracks from the past? Or yes, the, for the music that has inspired you. Ah, all the music that inspired us or our own music. No, no other people music that you heard and where you first heard electronic music? No, I really, uh, just one phrase, you know, for me, the, 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 the really liberating uh, art factor, the, the, the first thing that really got my soul was jazz, you know. Really? Absolutely. I grew up with the heroes 
of, of uh, cool, of course, from Miles Davis to Thelonious Monk and John Coltrane to Eric Dolphy and Sonny Rollins and all these great guys. For me, for me, this was not that I tried to copy this music, but it was uh, the, the spirit of this music encouraged me to s eventually try also something that has to do with finding yourself in what you're doing. So for me, jazz so was definitely the most important. Jazz gave you freedom of expression. Absolutely, it, it opened me up. Now, Boris. For me, I just peripherally was uh, involved in jazz at the end of the jazz when Miles Davis became a little bit more electronic, uh, like uh, uh, Herbie Hancock's piano playing in, in, in uh, those uh, music. And, uh, but finally, uh, the, uh, the people, oh no, the band who makes me making music was the normal warm leatherette. Warm. Really? That was, that, that, was Daniel a, Miller. A, that was a key number for me. Yeah. Wow. Still great today, yeah. still progressive, still modern, timeless. So Brilliant. where did you first you. hear electronic music? <laughs> hey, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, anyone uh, else with a question in the back there? In the... <laughs> we'll go back to Mark then if no one... Okay. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to swap chairs? Or... Um, where did you first hear electronic music? Uh, uh, I, I did... Uh, um, I get inspired very early by, by uh, Giorgi Ligeti. He has some uh, electronic kind of noises in his music. And of course, Sun Ra was, uh, he mixed up a, l a lot of electronic track, uh, electronic equipment in his band, the uh, Sun Ra and his orchestra. And the, the My first sort of influence really was uh, uh, Musica Electronica Viva. This was uh, an Italian uh, avant-garde band, but not, uh, have, uh, they, they were kind of considered uh, modern classical musicians, you know, but they used all kinds of uh, strange uh, things that created sounds and were treating these sounds live on stage. And each concert of them was a true experience. I mean, they never did the same thing twice. They were in a very influential band, unfortunately almost forgotten, but uh, this was giving me a great influence. And then another band was Can. The beginning of Can, I knew these guys, they made music for a theater in, in Zurich and I happened to know them and um, I was always wishing uh, to be a singer in a band like this. And then my wish became true in the person of Boris Blank. <laughs> what do you think of the, uh, the current electronic dance scene, Boris? What do, you th what do you think of the current electronic dance music scene? For me, you know, uh, as I told like uh, 30 years ago, I think you can replace each uh, conventional instrument like a bass guitar, like a snare drum, a bass drum, whatever, with some electronic equipment and it happens. At the time, people laughed after me and say, oh, Boris, you know. And I think I'm still open-minded uh, for new software, for new uh, plugins. I like them, and I know exactly what's good for my music architecture. And I feel that the field of electronic music worldwide is such a big field. You can't even hear in your whole life every all the releases coming out just in this hour we're talking together. There's maybe one uh, element uh, that drives uh, this music, which is not only uh, very uh, progressive. You know, uh, the, as it uh, as the sounds became so available and so easy, uh, uh, you know, Boris comes from when it was difficult to create a sound, and he still respects his sounds. And today, uh, a lot of this music, uh, the people who use the technology, they think they are uh, playing the instruments, but indeed they are being played by the instruments. And so you find an incredible uniformity uh, of sounds uh, today and very few examples of uh, original creators. 
uh, I mean, my 19-year-old son, when I say it, he says, well, you're not listening to all these interesting guys. Of course, there are many, many interesting people, but in general, uh, it, it, it is a little uniform, the whole thing, the sounds, when I hear them. Sure, thank you. One final thing before we go. Boris, can I ask you to describe your friend here in three words, and can you describe him in three words, please? Boris, first. Dieter is somehow the opposite, uh, of course, of my uh, kind. He likes to be in, in a big, uh, he's more extroverted and I'm more introverted. With a few words, I like to work continuously on one thing. Uh, as a monk, uh, you describe it at the beginning, up the hill. Uh, Dieter has so many different things. He has a, a, a plan, a, a, a cal calendar, which is full of here, 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 and he can manage this. I couldn't. I just stay in this little thing in my studio, as he described it as a child, building some stuff. Okay. These are three words, if you can, <laughs> for him. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be a little shorter. <laughs> Boris <laughs> is a sound wonder. Okay. Vielen Dank. Yellow, thank you. Dieter Boris. Craig, I got. Craig, we've just got uh, one, more, one more thing to do. Um, we just want to bring someone up on stage here. Hold on, guys. Um, as, as you have been such amazing pioneers and for the huge contribution uh, that you've made to the world of electronic music, we want to present you with the IMS um, Legends Award, which is from Pioneer. So for Yellow, congratulations. Here's Mark from Pioneer. Wow, that's a great uh, surprise, uh, honestly. And uh, I can see our name. It's not just a, a, a fake something. Wow. I just say thanks a lot. Thank you very much for, for this prize. <laughs> no, it's really uh, great to be here and to uh, get uh, a prize like from the center of this kind of music, which was or is what this whole festival is all about, is a, a very, very big honor. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.